welcome to the first Little River Cemetery tour. Uh, my job is to introduce you a little bit to uh, some information about the church here and also some of the other residents that you are not being portrayed tonight. So I have a script. Bear with me. I'm right here. Governor Melvin Tufts Fuller here. My interesting name comes from a combination of my parents' names, Alvin, after my father, Alvin, and Tufts, which was my mother's maiden name. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Fuller family name, Fuller Gardens and Runnymede Farm, probably come to mind. Those were two of my favorite projects. I was born way back in 1878 in Charlestown, Massachusetts, 141 years ago. In my lifetime, I've had many roles. An art collector, a philanthropist, a businessman, and a politician, but you probably got that when I introduced myself as governor. As a young man, I started repairing bicycles and took up bike racing to build up my bicycle repair business, winning many races. When I became attracted to automobiles in 1899, I sold all of my trophies so that I could take a trip to Europe and learn more about automobiles. And in 1903, I started a Packard franchise in Boston and later took on a Cadillac franchise. By 1920, my dealership had become the largest automobile dealership in the world. That business made me a very wealthy man. Viola Teresa Davenport, an opera singer in both Boston and Paris, agreed to marry me, and we married in the city of Paris in 1910. Visit the Fuller Gardens. I believe you can get passes at the Northampton Public Library. It is worth the trip, and remember, my viola when you visit the roses. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, you may recognize it now as Lamprey Energy, certainly, uh, but originally it was started by my father, Alvin, and his brother, Warren, way back when. I, of course, am David Morris Lamprey. I was born uh, on May 26, uh, 1910. I go by Morris, of course. You may remember seeing me uh, with my horse in the field, uh, pulling up the hay and everything. Um, I ran the, the Lamprey Brothers Company from 1944 until my retirement in 1986 when I was 72. Um, the Lamprey Homestead, of course, is still down the road at 63 Atlantic Avenue, uh, where the business is still located. Uh, it was built in 1801 by my ancestors. Uh, and my grandfather, David Janice Lamprey, was the first one to get into the fuel business. He originally started uh, cutting down timbers and then using the logs to cut into boxwood to deliver around uh, town. Uh, he would also cut blocks of ice from local ponds uh, for those same customers. And it wasn't until 1918 that he got his first actual delivery truck. Uh, you ordered two tons, that's what you got. People could always take me at that word. Most people who grew up in town will remember me sitting on that tractor seat with my dog, Rusty guiding the Belgians around town. Couldn't tell you how many times people would stop and take pictures um, of the horses as it pulled the cart. Of course, now there's the barn there, but uh, we probably stopped traffic quite a few times and made our way into more than one publication around as well. Back in the 1950s and 60s, I would let the neighborhood kids use the east end of the field uh, for their baseball games. Uh, there were a whole lot of kids in the neighborhood back then. Doesn't seem like there's quite so many now. So. Uh, they like to come up and see the new files each year as well. I sold my last Belgians in 1991, and about 10 years later I passed away in the year 2002 at the ripe old age of 92. Thank you very much for coming. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Do be mindful of the hay as you work your way around. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Sarah Brown, and I'm from Personality. My father was Jacob, and my mother was Hannah Lambrey. I was 16 when I died. I was sweet on a boy in town at the time of my death. I can't share his name because my folks wouldn't approve, but I'm pretty sure he was sweet on me too. I was looking forward to a future with marriage and lots of children, but my life was cut short. And I was of an age where I could help my folks around the farm, mostly in the house of my mother. Most young ladies of my age uh, were skilled with a needle and helped put their mothers in the kitchen and in the garden. I'm sure my folks really missed me after I died. As you can see, my dress is made of 10 minute of cotton. The fabric is light and it requires a shift to be worn beneath it. I'm wearing a cloak because coats did not come into fashion until many years later. We wore cloaks to protect us from the rain and sleet. 
Most women preferred red cloves, clo cloaks made from broadcloth trimmed with silk. You may not be familiar with the term broadcloth. It is a plain woven fabric using a heavier filling yarn from cotton. Much heavier than the cotton in my dress. My hooded cloak is black with a lighter interior and slits on the side to allow me to bring my hands through. No one knows for sure what I died of, but it was a time when many folks were dying of diseases that often took whole families. In the late 1790s, yellow fever was taking many lives in parts of New England, but it didn't reach New Hampshire. I've heard about yellow fever causes your skin and eyes to turn yellow, <laughs> high fevers and headaches too. Diphtheria was another fever that came with rashes and ulcers. It was a disease that mostly affected small children in my time along with measles. But I suspect that I died of influenza. Influenza caused with fever, chills, body aches, headache, and shortness of breath and a sore throat. I lived in an era where there wasn't, wasn't much the local doctor could do to help influenza. I hated to leave my family, but death put me on April 1st, uh, 1796. My name is Frederick Ogden Nash, but I go by Ogden. Here I lie in the cemetery close to one of my favorite places in the world, near the sea in Northampton. I was born in Rye, but not Rye, New Hampshire. I was born in Rye, New York in 1902. I guess I'm best known as an American poet and humorist. Does anyone know what a humorist is? It is someone who writes clever humor. Here, let me give you an example of my poem called Everybody Tells Me Everything. I find it difficult to enthuse over the current news. Just when you think that at least the outlook is so black that it can go no blacker, it worsens. And that is why I do not like the news. Because there has never been an era when so many things were going so right for so many of the wrong reasons. Now, I wasn't always a humorist. In my younger years, I tried many jobs. A bond salesman on Wall Street, I sold one bond in two years <laughs> to my godmother. <laughs> I tried my hand at teaching and even advertising copywriting. In 1925, I acquired a position in marketing department of Doubleday Publishing House. I did so well, I was moved to the editorial department to become a manuscript reader. Some of the manuscripts were so bad. I figured I'd try and see if I could do a little better. It was hard for me to write serious verse, as I preferred jotting down a little more of the lighthearted comic verse. My first book was a children's book called The Cricket of Carador, which I did in collaboration with my friend Joseph Alger. That was the beginning of my career. In 1930, I wrote a poem, Spring Comes to Murray Hill, which was inspired by a view from my office window and many musings of my life. I submitted the poem to the New Yorker magazine, and they not only published it, but they asked me to submit more of my work to them. 1931 was my first book published, Hard Lines. The book was full of quotes, such as, candy is dandy, a quicker squicker. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want to work, you have to work to earn enough money so that you won't have to work plus some longer pieces. The success of this book enabled me to quit my job at Doubleday and become a full-time author. 1931, the year I married my wife Frances Ryder Leonard. We had two daughters, Isabel and Linnell. Married life, fatherhood, and later grandfatherhood gave me lots of material for my writing. I love to study human nature and human relationships. Some of my work has been a result of married life with the ideas from and this is a quote often mentioned about me. The observation of people and the little quirks about the husband that pleases or displeases the wife, or the little quirks about the wife that pleases or displeases the husband. <laughs> I wrote many books and feel that I was very lucky to earn a living from something that I like doing. I did some screenplay writing in the late 1930s and early 1940s, writing for Metro Golden Meyer films, The Firefly, 1937, The Shining Hair, 1938. The Feminine Touch, 1941. In the 1950s and 60s, I focused more on the children's market. Some of you may be familiar with the old Disney films, Peter and the Wolf, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. I wrote for the television production versions. During my life, I was honored to be elected to both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Institute of Arts and Letters from my body of work. One of my favorite places to write was at my summer home on Little Boar's Head at 9 Atlantic Avenue in Northampton. We discovered New Hampshire in 1934 
had rented for many years before we purchased our little boar's head home in 1962. The view of the ocean is spectacular. Being a lover of the ocean, I rarely miss my daily swim, regardless of how cold the water is. You may not remember me. My name is Lillian Hillbaum Rogers. But I don't mind if you call me Lillian. In fact, I prefer it. Please do. I grew up in Wallingford, Connecticut, and I married Percy Couch Rogers in June of 1922. Shortly after our marriage, we spent time in Europe traveling and studying. <coughs> During that time, I had the opportunity to attend the University of Toulouse in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. That's the National School of Fine Arts in France, in Paris. When we came home, we settled in Exeter, where Percy had a job as a professor of Romance Languages at Phillips Exeter Academy. He focused on French and Spanish. I kept busy by raising our son, Brandon Miles, and became involved in the Exeter community. That is also when I began to write poetry and prose under the pen name of Lilja Rogers. I was pleased to be published in the Saturday Evening Post, the New Hampshire Profiles, Reader's Digest, and numerous other magazines. It was in 1939 that we had a chance to live in Stockholm, Sweden for a year, where I enrolled in the School of Foreign Languages. Upon our return, I was invited to share our experiences in Sweden with local teachers at the Exeter Supervisory Union. Percy retired in 1957, and we found our home near the ocean in Northampton, a little boar's head right down the street at 41 Atlantic Avenue. We fondly called the 1796 farmhouse Sea Wind Farm. It became our home, and we could hear the ocean waves and view the stars up above, as nearly perfect as it could be. Being a civic-minded person, I was often writing letters expressing my opinions. One such letter was written in 1966 to the Rotarian. I read an article about the rodeo and the bucking horses. In my letter, I expressed that the bucking straps put on horses was not mentioned in the article, and that perhaps the cruelty of wearing a bucking strap should be shared with the rider as well. The Portsmouth Power Plant in Seabrook provoked me to write a long letter in 1960, I'm sorry, 1976 to the Portsmouth Herald to express my concerns regarding the potential dangers from having a nuclear reactor in our seacoast. That was the same year that Percy passed away. This is Percy's grave stuff right over here. And this is mine. Perhaps you have checked out my volume of poetry, More Laughter. It was published in 1983, although many of the poems have already been published in various magazines or periodicals. One of my favorites is Hocus Pocus, which was published in both the Saturday Evening Post and the Boston Herald in 1963. I'm going to give you just a little bit of a quote. First, a howling blizzard woke us. Then the rains came down to soak us. Now before the eye can focus, crocus. <laughs> that book will be available in the library in here, right here in Northampton, too. I lived at Sea Wind Farm until my 90s, but had to move to a retirement home until my departing of this sweet earth in 1993. Here is my final resting place, right next to my beloved Percy. Perhaps my little poems will be my fragile immortality. <laughs> <laughs>